Hello, this is Forrest Blocker. I'm here today with Maxwell Blocker. Hello. And we're going to talk about ethics of genetic engineering, uh, GMO foods or genetically modified foods, and then leading up to genetic therapy for human disease. Breeders have been manipulating the genomes of animals and plants for thousands of years. Just it's by breeding animals together to get the kind of animal that they want. A GMO is an organism that has acquired one or more genes by artificial means rather than traditional breed. Instead of looking for those traits and isolating specific genes that you want through natural selection, instead you're picking out those traits in the laboratory. I mean it is kind of, but it, it's not really the same. Yeah? Tell me why not. Well, I mean, with uh, genetically modified food, you have to go down to, like, a genetic level, but then just with, like, breeding, you just take an animal, breed it with another animal, and then over a period of time, you get what you want eventually. With newer techniques of molecular biology, it is much easier to very specifically modify genes, and it can be done very, very quickly. It is really essential that scientists, lawmakers, and the public agree about how this technology should be used. Science has become so complicated that the public really doesn't understand the science, but they need to be involved in policy-making decisions. So the question is, how can scientists communicate with the public? I think that people have lost confidence in science. What do you think? Yeah, I think that people just don't believe that science works and I think that people believe that science is tied to corporations mm -hmm. and people are against corporations so they just don't like science. Right. So you're saying that people sort of conflate science and technology with a profit motive. Yeah. A study of all of the effects of genetic engineering can lead to the responsible use of the technology when it is fully developed. If we, uh, if we assume, just for the sake of argument at the beginning of this conversation, we assume that there might be something valuable in genetic engineering. And if there is, then we need to know what's safe and what's not safe, how the different technologies compare, and then we need to agree publicly politically and scientifically about what we should and should not do and how we should safeguard those things, right? Right. Okay. In 2014, there was a, a Pew study that concluded that 57% of Americans say it's generally unsafe to eat genetically modified foods. In the last five years, there have been 27,000 products added to the non-GMO product. Okay. Right. Groups like Consumers Union, Friends of the Earth, Physicians for Social Responsibility, the Center for Food Safety, the Union of Concerned Scientists, the American Nurses Association, Family Farm Defenders, Friends of the Earth, Healthcare Without Harm, they all think that there should be mandated labeling. 90% of consumers want GMO food to be labeled. 64 countries around the world require labeling of GMO food, including all European Union nations, Australia, Japan, Russia, and Brazil. So why do you suppose that companies would be opposed to labeling? Because they feel that maybe if they label something as GMO, that people won't buy it as often. Right. I think that that's exactly right. Is this fear of GMO foods, is it reasonable? I think it's reasonable to a degree, like uh, um, being afraid that companies like Monsanto will control uh, all of the seeds. Mm. I think that's something to be worried about. But I, I think that being worried that other than just... Um, food being sprayed with pesticides, that GMOs have some other effect, like people aren't afraid of pesticides necessarily on GMOs, but they're afraid of like, I don't know, something that they think is in GMO food. So maybe what, what needs to happen is that we need to really explore honestly and completely 
what the concerns of people are and to to dissect which of those concerns are reasonable and which of them are not and then look at the pros and cons are there reasons why GMO foods are a good idea are there reasons why they aren't at the end of the day the World Health Organization the American Medical Association the National Academy of Sciences and the American an association for the advancement of, of science have all declared that there's no evidence that GMOs are unsafe. Our expectations of science and technology are not what they once were. After the Second World War, people just generally believed, particularly in the United States, that the public at large would benefit from science and technology. Some of that worked out and some of it didn't. People thought it would lead to a more egalitarian or more equal life. Unfortunately, these labor-saving devices that we had in farming and industry, they were invented, but they haven't trickled down <laughs> to a better standard of living. In fact, people work harder than they used to. That makes people skeptical about technology. In, in Nixon's time, 1971, the, the war on cancer was declared. And since that time, we have spent a lot a lot of money doing research but the bottom line is we get a little bit more cancer than we used to and we are able to cure some cancers and we're able to provide better treatment for most cancers but those two things more can a little bit more cancer and a little bit better cures it actually comes out to be about a wash the same percentage of people die of cancer more or less than did in 1971. So that's a little bit disheartening. Because of all these things, I think that we have lost faith. And we've also kind of conflated our expectations of science and technology with the political realities of how that science and technology gets used. So I think that science and society have to be united through both vision and funding. And what do I mean by that? Well, the public has the right to decide how their tax money is going to be spent. Do people want to spend money on pure scientific research? I think that there's a reasonable argument for a lot of people to make that, you know what, we've spent a lot of money on science and it hasn't made our lives better. You know, we work harder. You know, these great big diseases haven't been cured. Why should we keep investing in science? Maybe it doesn't work the way we were promised. The other thing is that as a society, we need to have a vision of what our you know, big goals should be. Do, should we have big goals as, as a society? For example, should we figure out a, a technological way to, to stop climate change? So one way to solve the climate change crisis would be to have less people. Another way would be to have people adopt more of a Neolithic lifestyle, Stone Age lifestyle, where you know we all grow our own food, we all produce our own consumable products, we make our own baskets, we you know we do all that kind of thing. The problem with that idea is that most scientists agree that in order to support a Neolithic lifestyle, we need to use more land. And there isn't enough land to support seven billion people. Not to mention the fact that most people would be unwilling to give up those technological luxuries that we take for granted. So what do you think we should do about climate change? Um, well, if we stopped carbon emissions and just any emission that we can make, we'd still have the problem of, you know, pollution and water, the soil being used and stripped of nutrients, the air being heavily polluted. But I think that a good place to start is to start charging um, companies money for like every ton of pollution they release into the air so that they don't um, just do whatever they want, and that if you charge them, they're going to be less likely to want to put a lot of 
pollution out there. Yeah, the carbon tax. Yeah. Long term, what about the idea of also figuring out a way to make energy, electricity, without producing carbon emissions? That requires science, doesn't it? it yeah. This is one thing that a na that national vision or world vision, for that matter, can solve. Who decides we need to have a national vision where we agree, yes, we are willing to spend money to work collectively, to know and to be excited in the same way we were when we went to the moon. Do we have something like that in America today? I don't think so. No. Okay, so let's talk about what some of the pros and cons of genetic engineering and GMOs and gene therapy are. Some of the pros for GMOs are that it reduces costs of production. For a gene therapy or gene-derived medicine, you can produce cheaper and safer medicines. You can produce more crop and you can reduce world hunger. So those are some of the purported pros. Any monoculture industry has a tendency to reduce the cost of production. Some of the cons are that GMOs usually are grown in a monoculture situation and monoculture can lead to... Another con is seed sustainability. Farmers can no longer just uh, gather seeds at the end of the harvest and use those same seeds over again. The companies insist that the farmers buy the seeds from the, from the company over and over again. Allergens can cause immune responses by introducing peptides or proteins that people are allergic to. Another thing is resistance. Because GMOs are designed to, to have certain traits, some of those traits might include resistance to certain kinds of insects or resistance to certain kinds of herbicides. Farmers then can spray pesticides and herbicides on their crops without those crops dying, but the weeds and the pests die. The, just like any other evolutionary process, if you have one herbicide or one pesticide that is sprayed over and over again, you will find that those insects or weeds that um, live in that area, some of them will have random mutations and some of those random mutations will allow them to live in, uh, within the realm of those pesticides and herbicides. And so over time, those will competitively breed out the ones that are, you know, that can be affected by those pesticides and insecticides. And so you're essentially using selective breeding to breed insects and weeds that are resistant to the pesticides and the herbicides. Another problem is potential containment, which means if you introduce a gene into a species that can reproduce, can that gene then get into other species that you might not want it to get into? People are concerned that the results of genetic engineering are unpredictable. Do we really know, by introducing a gene, how it's going to affect every other metabolic pathway in that organism? Not to mention the metabolic pathways in organisms that it, that gene might get into that are not intended or that are not the target organism. Once you introduce a gene, the process can be irreversible. Once you get the gene in, you can't get it out. And then finally, one thing that people are concerned about is could genetic engineering products be used as a weapon? One of the most controversial and most widely discussed crops is something called golden rice. 250 million preschool age children around the world suffer from a vitamin A deficiency between 250,000 and 500,000 go blind as a result of that deficiency every year. 
125 to 250,000 will die every year. Much of the affliction is in Southeast Asia where people rely on rice for the nutrition, particularly poor people. You can put beta carotene into rice with a genetic modification. And beta carotene, once you eat it, that's a precursor for vitamin A. So once it's inside your body, you start making vitamin A. So in 1999, scientists transferred genes from daffodils and bacteria to create a beta carotene producing rice. And ultimately, they produced this rice, which makes 20 times as much beta carotene as original rice. And that means that if children ate one cup of this golden rice a day, it would eliminate their need for extra vitamin A. But largely due to public opinion, rather than any specific scientific wor uh, worry, golden rice still is not commercially available. What are the pros and cons of this particular technology? And even if we're like really adamantly anti-GMO because we don't know what's going to happen in the future, in the meantime, literally millions of children who would not have died have died. Is the danger or the potential danger or the fear more important than the very real possibility that you know, those children would not have died. And again, this is an issue where we have to consider science and technology in the context of the political and social environment. So one of the political and social environments in this case is people are afraid of GMOs. Maybe reasonably, maybe not reasonably. But we're also living in a world where some people are poor and they will die yeah. right now in the short term. What do you think? I, I think that being picky about what, I think being picky about food that could save um, millions of people's lives is stupid. And I think that, you know, golden rice should be made commercially available. Yeah. Well, I do too, and there have been quite a lot of studies, and it would be, you know, even if people were worried about it, what really doesn't make sense is these fields where they're growing, like in, for example in the Philippines, where they're growing golden rice so that they can do the research. If you, if you vandalize those fields, y you can't do the research. So it's like right from the beginning, they're not even willing to consider the possibility that it could be safe. But they, they're not, are they offering alternatives for these children with vitamin A deficiency? Another genetic modification that has been introduced into a lot of agricultural crops is something called BT, which stands for Bacillus thuringiensis. In 1901 in Japan, a scientist studying silkworms learned that the silkworms be, were being killed in Japan, were dying, because of a natural infection from this particular bacteria. It turns out to be a great insecticide. The bacteria makes a toxin and binds to specific proteins on the inside part of the lumen of the gut. This only affects insects. Mammals don't have the proteins that can recognize this toxin. But it does affect a variety of different kinds of insects. And there are a variety of, of this particular bacteria that produce different toxins that can be targeted to, to different insects. In the 1980s, researchers put that gene from one Bt variety into tobacco plants, which then could produce their own insecticide. In 1995, the EPA approved Bt potatoes, corn, and cotton. Other GMO projects include things that are centered around increasing production. For example, there's uh, drought-tolerant corn, heat-tolerant sugarcane, salt-tolerant or water-conserving wheat. And that's a, a really important one because if we run out of fresh water, or we have problems with fresh water, if we can grow wheat, 
in salt water. There are a lot of places in the world where they could grow wheat and there's cotton that requires less nitrogen fertilizer. Another one is GMO products that work against disease in the agricultural crop. So there are virus-resistant plums and beans being developed, disease-resistant cassava, and bacteria-resistant oranges. There are aesthetics. For example, there is a GMO non-browning apple. There's nutrition enhancement. For example, there's a GMO potato that produces fewer natural toxins. There are soybeans that produce less saturated fat. There's high iron and vitamin A rice. There's high calcium carrots, antioxidant tomatoes, non-allergenic nuts. So people who have nut allergies would be able to eat nuts. There's corn and cassava with extra nutrients. And there are flax-like plants that produce a healthy oil formerly available only in, in fish. So what do you think about those? I think they all sound like um, good GMO projects. They don't sound dangerous to me. All right, so let's talk about some of the negative things about GMO. One of the things that is a, a very reasonable argument is monoculture. So on the one hand, monoculture allows us to grow great big plots of the same crop, whether it's GMO or not. Monoculture in general is the agricultural practice of producing or growing one single crop, plant, or livestock species, variety, or breed in the same place at the same time. But it also risks the food supply, GMO or not. Whenever you have a uniform crop, it is going to be susceptible to one pathogen. Some examples, historical examples of, of this are in Ireland in 1845, there was um, a potato that came from America called the lumper potato. and it, it succumbed to a potato fungus called the blight and it led to almost the complete failure of the potato crop throughout Ireland and many people starved to death because of that. In the early 1990s Holstein calves were dying in, in their first six months of life and were found to be a homozygous for a particular metabolic deficiency disease called bovine leukocyte adhesion deficiency, which was traced back to one single bull that was used widely in the industry. Monoculture is widely used in modern industrial agriculture because it in increases yields. Modern farming is an industry which is driven by profits rather than needs. Even though we can produce more yield, we're still not feeding all the people in the world. Farmers have to grow what they can sell. Traditionally, farmers save seeds from one farming season to another. Companies like Monsanto develop GMO seeds that resist Roundup, which is a weed killer, yeah. and patents the seeds. So the farmers would get sued if they reused them? Yes, and they do get sued if they reuse them. In fact, they get sued even if there's a, a GMO crop in the neighboring farm that cross-pollinates with your corn and your corn winds up with the gene in your seeds. So, How would you control that? Well, that's a, a big problem and it's a problem that we have to address. Another problem is that companies like Monsanto, Syngento, Bayer, Dow, and DuPont have bought up more than 200 other companies allowing them to dominate access to seeds. Another concern of anti-GMO activists has to do with a high rate of suicide among, for example, Indian farmers. And the argument goes something like this. They, they're they encouraged to buy the seeds. They're told that the companies are going to come back and buy their products. Sometimes they don't. The seeds cost twice as much. And when you're a subsistent level farmer, you have to be able to get the money back at, at the end of the day when you have you know, made your crops, especially if you're spending twice as much money on the seeds. There are a lot of Indian farmer suicides. And there were thou literally thousands of these farmers who committed suicide. The anti-GMO people say, well, this is because you know, they used these GMO crops and they didn't work. They didn't get the increased yield they were promised. They weren't able to sell their crops and so on. There was a, a report in 2008 published by the International Food Policy Research Institute 
that did not find a correlation between those suicides and the people who were producing BT cotton. In this case, that was the GMO crop that most people were associating with those suicides. And really, those suicides are fairly constant uh, within the national overall suicide rate since uh, 1997, even though cotton was introduced, the GMO cotton was introduced into India in 2002. Okay, another concern that people have about um, GMOs is the possibility of the introduction of allergens for food crops that normally wouldn't have those particular allergens. In one case, for example, in 1996, soybeans were engineered with a gene from a Brazil nut, which was intended to improve their value as animal feed, but instead it also produced an allergic response in people who were allergic to Brazil nuts. Another example is the papaya. In 2002, a study initially showed that there was a short stretch of the ring spot virus coat protein allergen. But then they continued to do more research and all the way through 2010, and a lot of the little peptide was not intrinsically allergenic. Worldwide, herbicide-resistant crops are grown on more than 80% of the land allotted to GMOs. There's more herbicide being used. If your crops are engineered to withstand Roundup, you can spray it profusely without killing your crop. GMOs are part of that problem. Farmers are now turning to older, more toxic herbicides because there are now weeds growing in the area where the Roundup was being sprayed that have become resistant to Roundup as well as the crops. The selective breeding of the weeds. Millions of acres of U.S. farmland are now infested with weeds that have become resistant to the herbicide glyphosate, which is Roundup. Worldwide, insect-resistant crops are grown on about 50% of the land allotted to GMOs. Insect-resistant GMOs have led to a lower use of insecticide. Corn rootworms resistant to the insecticide Bt, remember that comes from a bacteria, yep. which some GMO corn varieties produce. Three quarters of the corn and cotton grown in this country is engineered to resist insects using the Bt gene. In 1999, a coalition led by Greenpeace, the Center for Food Safety, the Pesticide Action Network, and the International Federation of Organic Agriculture sued the Environmental Protection Agency to revoke Bt approvals. The suit said that Bt crops might create insecticide-resistant insects and cause direct harm to non-target organisms. Like bees. Yes and no. The question is whether Bt does attack bees it's That's, possible, but it's not really been proven. I was just, that was an example. A better example would have been butterflies. Another example would be butterflies, but I don't think that that's the, what, that, that was the concern that they were raising. That's a different concern. So one concern that, that you alluded to is whether or not BT can directly harm bees or butterflies. And the answer is yes, in sufficient quantity they can. Uh, it depends on the strain. Okay. Um, the second part of that question is, in the same way that we've developed Roundup resistant weeds, will we also develop insecticide resistant insects? Pollination vectors, including bees, have been declining in the United States for over 20 years. 33% of all agricultural crops, including 100% of almonds, 90% of apples, broccoli, blueberries, and onions, 80% of celery and cherries are all pollinated by bees. Since the 1980s, there has been a 30% drop in the managed honeybee population. There has been recently, starting in 2004, a condition called colony collapse disorder, or CCD for short. 
And there are a variety of uh, reasons that are given to as the cause of CCD. Most experts now agree that it's a combination of factors. It results in bees becoming disoriented and not being able to find their way back to their hives. Uh, one of the causes for CCD is a, a new class of insecticide. It's a non-GMO insecticide called neoarnicotinoids a new class of insecticides, which are non-GMOs, that affect the central nervous system of insects. Another is due to malnutrition, and that might be contributed to by the fact that a lot of bees are exposed to monoculture, so they only get one kind of pollen. There are a couple of different kinds of parasitic mites that attack bees, bee larvae, Another is a kind of fungus, and then there's also a virus. Most of the bees in the United States are European bees, and they have supplanted the native bees. So they're monogenetic largely, which means that when one gets sick, they're all going to get sick. So that's part of the problem. Bt could possibly be a contributing factor. Most scientists, including the USDA, agree that Bt crops alone have little effect. GM crops have been widely planted since the 1990s, but CCD didn't really appear until 2006. There are two Bt varieties that some studies have suggested reduce the longevity of honeybee adults. Monarch butterflies have also been suggested to be affected by some kinds of Bt. All right, so let's talk about gene therapy. Gene therapy, just like genetic modification, could be used to accentuate certain traits of people. But, I mean, why would you want to, like, tell your kid, oh yeah, we changed who you are before you were even you, just because society said that you should be this way and you shouldn't be that way. And I don't think that's okay. I think that you should have your kid and let your kid be what you, like, made them. You shouldn't, like, interfere with, like, who they are. Because if you make, like, your kid taller, you're just, like, basically saying, well, I know what society wants and I'm changing my child literally and physically to bow down to society and what they want. And I think instead we should be challenging the idea that taller people or skinnier people get jobs more often because I don't think that's fair. And I mean, I don't think that a good way to challenge that is just to be feeding that role more. What is a reasonable thing to select for and what is not a reasonable thing to select for? Let me give you an example. There are some genetic conditions that cause, reduce life expectancy. And some people call them diseases, but some people think that they are an individual condition. It'd be a way for people to kind of, to kind of make it clear or to say that how you are is wrong yeah and so we want to change that for your children it's like you know so that would be you know that would be a case where i think it, i think that could be a gray area i mean i think that there is something to be said for variability both in our gene pool and in society there's a there's reason why we should have different hair color, different skin color, different height, different abilities. You know, we should have differences. And it can, you know, that's how evolution works. We want to have differences. Some of those differences are good, some are bad, some are both, depending on the situation. So what's the difference between something that's different and something that's a disease? At what point, what kinds of things should be treated with gene therapy if we can cure them with gene therapy? Um. Stuff that, like, would make it hard to live or that would make it, like, would make the person that has the disease or whatever not want to live. Like, um, if you had a heart defect, it would make it hard to live and you might not want to live. And I guess that would apply to, like, Down syndrome and dwarfism as well. But I feel like things that have to do with appearance 
shouldn't be changed because that just kind of shames the appearance of a lot of people and I think that we should not instead of trying to change stuff like that we should celebrate people that have stuff like that because they aren't different they're just well they are different physically but they're not different as people they're still people they have value as human beings exactly and just because they look differently doesn't mean they should be treated differently as people Mm -hmm. and um but if it's internal like um if you have like uh problems with your lungs and like only one of your lungs can function then that would be something that you'd want to change because that would make it difficult for you physically to function okay all right so we've talked about some of those things so the questions that we've asked are what is normal what is a di- disability or dis- or a disorder and who decides what about its potential use for enhancing athletic ability, physical appearance, or even intelligence? And we've talked about some of those things. And we've roughly kind of scratched out what some of the parameters are, but it, it's clear that it's a complicated situation, something that I think requires public discussion, informed public discussion. Okay, then the other question is, is somatic gene therapy more or less ethical than germline therapy? So I think I should explain, even though I'm sure you probably already know this, the difference between somatic gene therapy and germline therapy. So germline therapy is therapy where you change the genes in reproductive cells so that those genes get passed on to all future generations. Somatic gene therapy is where you change genes in cells, somatic cells, that um, are just the cells in your body and they get replicated to fix, you know, when your arm gets a scratch or, you know, you need to replace some cells, but they don't get passed on to the next generation. Uh, Most scientists agree that at least right now, and maybe not philosophically, we should not mess with germline therapy. Now, part of that argument comes from the fact that we don't know what the long-term effects of germline therapy would be for things like evolution. We don't know that we're not making some technical mistakes and we don't want to screw up the, the genes of you know the whole species. Part of that. But even if we could do it, a lot of scientists don't think that we should do it. And that's a fuzzier ethical area that needs to be discussed. It has been done. It was recently done in China. So it is being done. People will do it. It's not illegal in a lot of parts of the world to do it. And private companies can do it. So preliminary attempts at gene therapy are expensive, very expensive. So who will have access to these therapies and who will pay for their use? Inexpensive. Relatively Like expensive. right now it's like, what, $20,000? Or what's the price? Of a root canal? Not of a root canal. Oh, of gene therapy? It can cost a million dollars. Exactly. Does a root canal cost a million dollars? No, it would no. cost like 500 to to $1,000, which is cheaper. And then a teeth cleaning costs like right now it's expensive but you know at one point in a new discovery everything was expensive like for example um dna testing to see um you know like a at a homicide at a homicide investigation to see if there's dna like on a knife of a victim um that was super expensive it was like ridiculous like I think it was actually twenty thousand dollars and now it's not as expensive I don't know how expensive it is but it's definitely way cheaper than that right so I mean everything goes down with price science is supported or should be supported by not just public money money is not the only thing that has value in society we have, as a society, we have the ability to have a, a, a vision of the future. We have ideals that we strive for. We have things that we want. You know, I always talk about going to the moon, but it could be art and it could be, 
you know, literacy. It could be gardens. It could be a clean air. In the 1970s, there was a Recompetent DNA Advisory Committee, or RAC for short, that was created as a you know, kind of a, a committee within the NIH, or the National Institute of Health. In the 1980s, RAC created the Human Gene Therapy Networking Group, or Human Gene Therapy Subcommittee. The United States Office of Technology Assessment, or OTA, published a background paper, Human Gene Therapy, also in the 1980s. The RAC subcommittee prepared a points to consider document for public presentation. In the 1990s, the NIH approved the compassionate use exemption of gene therapy for a critically ill patient. The Hugo Ethics Committee made a statement about gene therapy ethics. And in that case, the, the idea that germ line cell therapy should be avoided was reiterated. And so we wanted to encourage the adoption of international guidelines, some kind of international agreement about, you know, do we have to have laws or should we have a gentleman's agreement or what? Okay, then in the 2000s, the NIH Advisory Committee published a set of guidelines on gene manipulation. The American Association for the Advancement of Science called for a moratorium on attempts to cure genetic diseases through gene line therapy. There are possible regulatory schemes that include a, a, a plan to completely ban germline therapy. The American Medical Association's Council on Ethical and Judicial Affairs stated that genetic interventions to enhance traits should be considered permissible only in severely restricted situations like one, clear and meaningful benefits to the fetus or child, two, no trade-off with other characteristics or traits, three, equal access to genetic technology irrespective of income or other socioeconomic characteristics. Some of the serious inherited genetic diseases can only be treated through germline therapy. Uh, the Department of Health ruled in 2014 that the government does not define mitochondrial donation as a form of genetic modification. Not all countries agree. In April of 2015, researchers in China edited the genomes of some human embryos. It caused a giant stir in most of the rest of the world. Privately funded research on editing the human germline remains legal in the United States. There was a meeting in 2015 in February, which was a meeting about CRISPR-Cas9, which is a kind of programmable nuclease that allows the very, very precise editing of genes. There were a collection of experts, developers and users of CRISPR-Cas9 technology and experts in genetics, law, Bioethics discussed the implications and rapid expansion of the genome editing field, engineering field. The goal was to initiate an informed discussion of the use of genome engineering technology and to identify those areas where action is essential to prepare for future development. The highlights were no germline therapy. Secondly, disease selection. Gene therapy seems to be more acceptable for the treatment of deadly diseases rather than using it for the treatment of, for example, mental disorders. Indels are the improper targeting where you can incorporate the therapeutic gene into a patient's germline or their reproductive cells. Governments and regulatory agencies throughout the world are grappling with how to facilitate the use of bi biotechnology in agriculture, industry, medicine, while ensuring that new products and procedures are safe. Australia, Canada, Germany, Israel, Switzerland, and the Netherlands prohibit germline therapy uh, for application in human beings. Uh, in the U.S., all projects are evaluated for potential risks by regulatory agencies such as the FDA, the EPA, the NIH, and the Department of Agriculture. The U.S. has no federal controls specifically addressing human genetic modification. The U.S. Uh, NIH's recommendations for recombinant DNA advisory committee states that 
It will not at present entertain proposals for germline alterations. However, in the United States, there is no federal legislation specifically addressing human genetic engineering. Okay, that's it for today. The next time we're going to be talking about some of those um, programmable nucleases, how they actually work, what, what the mechanism is, what some of the, the, the different ways to approach putting genes into um, patients who need their, their genes either corrected or added to. Okay, thank you. Thanks.